Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. I'm Rebecca Power, and I will be moderating uh, the webinar today. The purpose of The Current is to increase access to university extension programming and research that can strengthen water resource management across the Midwest. Um, as a reminder, all of our webinars will be archived uh, on the North Central Region Water Network website at northcentralwater.org and also at learn.eextension.org. Uh, we currently have 18 up there now, so lots of great information for folks. Our topic today is extension programs for youth environmental and STEM education. Uh, we'll have about three 10-minute uh, segments each with questions and discussion at the end. So for for participants, you can submit your questions for presenters via the chat box, and that chat box should be in the lower left-hand corner of your screen in a gray, gray area with the heading chat. Uh, and of course, presenters, you can also ask questions of one another. That said, let's go to our next slide, uh, introducing today's presentations. Brandon Schroeder will be uh, presenting from Michigan State University. Uh, the title of his talk is Water Stewardship Through Place-Based Education. Justin Huffam from the University of Wisconsin Extension will be talking about technology in water education. And then finally, Kelly Feehan from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln talking about stormwater sleuth and running rain youth education resources. And just uh, to introduce Brandon, uh, as I said, he's at Michigan State University. He's a, a Sea Grant educator, works with coastal communities in Northeast Michigan. Uh, and I'll just uh, let you briefly take a look at uh, the rest of his introduction. And with that, we will go ahead and get started with his presentation. Go ahead, Brandon. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited, and uh, thank you, Rebecca, for inviting us to share a perspective of water uh, stewardship and engaging youth in water stewardship through uh, place-based education opportunities. So to introduce myself, I'm an, uh, a, sea grant, a Michigan Sea Grant Extension educator. Uh, the Michigan Sea Grant is a NOAA uh, uh, program administered in Michigan through the University of Michigan and Michigan State University Extension. So in my extension role, um, and in our Sea Grant role, we're always thinking about uh, promoting Great Lakes science and how to uh, better connect or, or benefit from that Great Lakes science and coastal communities through education and outreach. So as you'd guess, at the heart of the Great Lakes, we have a pretty significant investment in water stewardship. And a large part of our conversation is framed, uh, what I will say is framed, framed in Great Lakes, uh, these Great Lakes literacy principles that have been developed collectively by our, our Great Lakes uh, Sea Grant program. And, in parallel with our, our sister programs in the ocean coast states, uh, where we've got these uh, principles, uh, uh, literacy principles that we believe every every citizen in the Great Lakes region and, and perhaps the country should uh, really know and understand uh, about the Great Lakes in terms of their value as these amazing freshwater seas and, and freshwater resources. A significant portion of that conversation is really aimed at, at partnering or collaborating with schools and teachers and youth in, in making that connection with uh, Great Lakes stewardship in the context of knowing that we take care of our Great Lakes. You know, they take care of us with clean drinking water and uh, beaches to swim on and, and fish to catch for food and fun. Uh, so these Great Lakes literacy principles really frame a lot of our education work. And we uh, do quite a bit uh, of things in the education realm from working directly with youth, uh, providing uh, professional development for educators, sponsoring education, workshops, and conferences, et cetera. Uh, but today I wanted to, 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 with that framework in mind, wanted to center in on, on an initiative that we've been leading in Northeast Michigan, a place-based education network and partnership, the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative. And um, in, a, in a brief mission statement, I would say, you know, really this initiative is aimed at protecting our Great Lakes and natural resources of Northeast Michigan through hands-on learning uh, in and with the community. So it's a very school-focused initiative, uh, really aimed at, at connecting our schools, teachers, and youth as valued uh, partners in our, in our community. And to visualize that, uh, I, like, I like this Venn, Venn diagram because it really gets at that idea of uh, this is a, a school 
uh, focused initiative, a uh, place-based education initiative where we're really aimed at enhancing uh, student uh, learning and leadership, but in the context of engaging them in environmental stewardship projects that are going to make a difference, a real difference in their community. So there's a little bit of a community development opportunity there. And I always, um, I'm a fishery science uh, scientist by background, uh, and I always kind of uh, say that there's this, this science to education too, right? So place-based, community-based education, there's a lot of literature and, and resources out there that I encourage you uh, to check out. David Sobel and, and Greg Smith and John Yoder. Uh, Amy Demarest is a teacher practitioner who uh, wrote uh, place-based uh, curriculum design. A lot of great resources to kind of think about place-based education as, as a, an educational framework uh, to engage students in environmental, environmental stewardship, in this case, water, water stewardship. So our, our regional network at a Michigan scale, we uh, partner uh, with the Great Lakes Fishery Trust through a statewide Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative. Uh, so across the state, uh, we uh, work uh, at very, in various ways with uh, nine different regional hubs that look at uh, using place-based education to connect schools with their community uh, through environmental stewardship projects. And in Northeast Michigan, um, that regional partnership really has three legs uh, to the stool. We have the what I'll call conservation uh, or, or environmental stewardship partners like Michigan Sea Grant interested in the Great Lakes, Fish and Wildlife Service, the par our Department of Natural Resources, uh, et cetera. We have the education partners who have youth development, uh, academic learning, youth leadership at the forefront of their minds. That's the schools, our educational service districts, 4-H youth programs. And of course, our funders are in invaluable when it comes to getting students on buses to get them out to field sites. And that's our, our fishery trust funders and our local community foundation who help us to get funding uh, uh, in the, to the right people at the right place at the right time. That funding really uh, releases a lot of these, these uh, really dynamic opportunities uh, and allows us to uh, do some pretty, pretty awesome things. Uh, and so, uh, just, I guess, as a point of pride, we, you know, we, we live at, uh, in Northeast Michigan is a very rural uh, community. Uh, a lot of these schools and communities are very disconne disconnected in terms of broad, uh, uh, expansive geography. Uh, between the communities, uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot of the same issues you see around the country with unemployment, and we deal with a lot of uh, uh, resource conservation issues like, like water stewardship. Uh, but this is also a region uh, very rich in Great Lakes and natural resources, lots of uh, public open space and uh, along the Lake Great Lakes coastline, lots of water resources and, and forest uh, woodland resources. So these communities, in, in terms of sense of place, are very connected with their natural resources. And so we have a very a significant investment uh, from our schools, more than 30 schools involved, the teachers, 145 teachers, lots of community partners. And uh, about in 2015, about almost 5,000 youth that were engaged in fielding environmental stewardship projects. And by urban, uh, by urban metrics, that may not sound like a, a lot of students, but in, in our region, that represents approximately one in five or 20 percent of our of our student audience. So we're pretty pretty proud to have that investment of our schools uh, within uh, and across these communities. <clears throat> so with those numbers in mind, over half of those. Uh, are invested in water stewardship projects. Uh, so we have water uh, monitoring and invasive species monitoring and water habitat restoration projects, a whole variety of projects happening across uh, this Northeast Michigan uh, geography. And uh, occasionally uh, we seek opportunities such as this 2013 Youth Watershed Summit to bring uh, representatives from schools across the eight counties we serve to kind of share, uh, you know, their success stories and, and lessons learned and, and trade data, data sets and, and those kinds of uh, things. So uh, there's work, a lot of work going on across the region on a very local scale and then as a, re as a regional partnership we really try to find ways to cross connect the schools that we're working with across across the region. Uh, and in terms of making the community connections, uh, we, 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 um, our goal is not to read that. We, we, we leverage a lot of the uh, really great existing water quality resources out there such as the 4-H uh, uh, water quality, 4-H tool, uh, curriculum, uh, the NOAA Be Wet Bay Watershed Education Training Work, and some of the local grants and uh, initiatives, such as our Northeast Michigan Council of Governments uh, investment in, in promoting uh, watershed uh, community collaboration. So we're always trying to draw in those community resources and other water education resources. So um, from a team study perspective, I, I wanted to just kind of uh, bump through a couple examples to show some of the depth and breadth 
uh, of the work that we're doing and, and largely even the diversity of the work. I think the, the great value in the place-based education strategy is that not every project is going to is going to look, look the same and, and that's by design. So the students are really exploring different projects in the context of their local water resources and uh, the needs and opportunities of, of their local communities and we think that's important. So by design, these projects look different. But just some examples, uh, the Thunder Bay watershed, one of our largest watersheds uh, with some NOAA be wet resources, uh, connected a, a pile of schools up and down the watershed really through a water quality monitoring after, after collecting chemical and biological and physical data and, 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 and comparing and sharing those data up and, up and down the coastline. Uh, similarly, in a, in a watershed cell, uh, we connected the Augre Sims Elementary uh, School with a watershed project where fourth and fifth graders uh, not only collected data but partnering with National Geographic and Sea Grant used the GIS-based uh, online reporting platform, the Great Lakes Field Scope, to, uh, to map, to organize and map those data uh, in, in a very visual way. Uh, shooting to the middle school, uh, another watershed study with the, the Trout River. This is a 4-H partnership. These uh, students in Rogers City schools are, are partnering with 4-H to collect data for their local drain commissioner who uh, it, it takes a lot of responsibility for managing uh, that particular river. And at a high school level, this is the Black River uh, Watershed Project at Alcona high school, but several examples of this where high school students are collecting data. Uh, and at a high school level, these are largely in the context of, of watershed management plans. Here, these students are collecting uh, data in the context of, of uh, creating baseline data for a watershed management plan. Um, shifting a little bit to more of an issues focus, uh, you know, marine debris, uh, plastic pollution isn't just an ocean issue. Uh, we deal with that in the Great Lakes. We've got several schools uh, adopting beaches, uh, cleaning up uh, uh, trash and uh, collecting uh, coastal uh, water quality data along our Great Lakes coastline, uh, really raising awareness of marine debris in their communities. Uh, these uh, students and elementary students with Alpena Public Schools uh, built underwater robots with our National Marine Sanctuary Program and, and asked the simple question, how could we use these underwater robots? And here uh, they participated as a part of a NOAA-sanctioned uh, research study to look at invasive species. Uh, uh, the um, colonization rates of invasive mussels, zebra and quagga mussels on uh, archaeological resources, uh, shipwrecks in the Great Lakes. And in my mind, uh, these invasives are a huge ecological problem, but I hadn't ever, until working with the students, considered the uh, impacts uh, to these, uh, these heritage archaeological resources, uh, which are also significant. And students, again, raising, uh, elevating the awareness of that issue in their community. And a biodiver biodiversity conservation uh, uh, angle. Uh, a very big uh, conservation strategy underway for biodiversity in Lake Huron. Um, in the oceans we have uh, coral reefs, in the Great Lakes we have ugly rock reefs, but um, these rock reefs are important spawning habitat for a significant number of native species, particularly at the bottom here, uh, whitefish and lake trout. Uh, the students are collaborating as a part of a pretty big research uh, and restoration project and uh, they raise these uh, little lake trout in their classroom and, and, and also here use underwater ro robots to deploy these lake trout, uh, you know, 40 to 60 feet down on these, uh, on these reefs. Uh, so pretty neat uh, connecting technology and engineering to uh, uh, biodiversity conservation. So I want to end with three slides. Uh, I think, you know, we're pretty excited about the depth and breadth of, of the kinds of work we can do uh, when we kind of think about this place-based education strategy. Uh, you know, we're value valuing these students as partners um, in water stewardship today. You know, they're not just our future, but they're partners today. And I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities that come with partnering with these students. Uh, not just their learning, but uh, they can they can raise awareness about these water stewardship issues in ways that we as conservation uh, professionals may not even be able to do because people love uh, the stories behind the scenes. So, so three slides and strategies. I think uh, the first is and foremost is hands-on Hands-on learning, uh, you know, just being out there supporting and creating opportunities to get students out into the field. We don't call them field trips. They're site visits when they're out in the field. They're not just learning. Uh, they're, they're conducting projects. They're getting their feet wet, conducting real-world projects, often side-by-side -side with professionals or scientists. Uh, so it's not just a field trip. And that's my dinger. So I will I'll wrap up here with uh, my last two slides. Uh, supporting educators through professional development. Uh, 
professional development in our mind is not just a workshop, it's a sustained relationship with these teachers where we help them uh, understand science content, you know, understand fisheries biology if they're working on a fisheries project. Uh, that process, that place-based learning process, and creating those partner uh, relationships between schools, between schools, community partners, uh, but looking at it as a sustained relationship with our teacher, providing the support along their path to engaging students in these projects. And lastly, um, fostering school and community partnerships. Um, when schools and communities work together, produce powerful par partnerships that really benefit all, and, and making uh, those right uh, connects between schools and the community partners, uh, the community development goals, the water stewardship goals, the conservation plans, where students can insert themselves and really make a difference. I, I think that's, in my mind, uh, the strategy that we've been most fond of because students know when they're contributing in a real world way. And uh, it really shows uh, in, in their academic um, uh, learning and it shows in, in the pride they take in their projects. So with that, I will say thank you and I will pass uh, the torch back to you, Becca. For Great. Thank time. you, Brandon. I want to go play with you. <laughs> Those look like some really fun and inspiring <laughs> projects. Thank you for sharing them with us. And um, my guess is we'll hear more of, of those kinds of things from Justin Huffam. Uh, uh, Justin is a faculty at the University of Wisconsin Extension, and he uh, also is the director of uh, Upham Up Woods uh, Outdoor Learning Center. I, I hope I didn't butcher that too bad. 4-H uh, 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 youth camp here in Wisconsin doing great work up there, and you'll hear a little bit about that in a minute from Justin. So. Justin, go right ahead. Great. Thanks, Rebecca, and uh, thanks, everyone, for signing up today. Um, my name is Justin Huffam, and I work out at uh, uh, Upham Woods, which is a 310-acre property on the Wisconsin River. And much of our curriculum and our leadership opportunities do surround uh, topics that um, deal with the river itself. Uh, we're strung out along four and a half miles of shoreline on the river, and it's a obvious classroom for us. Um, we are just coming into our 75th year of existence, and um, this is a little uh, slide that goes at the beginning of all my pieces here. Uh, just uh, and to point out, um, you know, 75 years ago, we were working towards the advancement of conservation, agriculture, and rural culture, and um, I'm proud to say we're still doing that today. Um, 4-H groups uh, comprise about uh, one-third of who we serve. Uh, the other uh, two-thirds are school groups that are coming from middle schools from all over the state, from, and some from Illinois, and uh, we recently had some from Nebraska, actually, too. Um, we have, uh, we, we, we're a residential facility, and we house up to 200 people at a time. And uh, last year served uh, just over 10,000 folks on-site and 2,000 off-site with our outreach. This is a photograph of the Wisconsin River and some of our canoeists uh, following the uh, universal law of kids in canoes, which is that no two canoes can be pointed in the same direction at the same time. Um, and you'll notice the perspective here is from the air, and it's from a drone uh, that took this photo, and, and these are some students here um, on site when that was taken. And actually, the photo you see here is also taken by a drone. Um, and um, I think it's one of many examples of where technology intersects our watershed education and technology intersecting our um, out, outdoor and environmental sciences. Um, um, you heard um, Brandon mention this author, David Sobel, um, and the, um, the intrinsic value of, of, of nature as a part of education is something we believe in very strongly. And um, we also uh, understand that that's a changing landscape that now includes technology, whether you're in the classroom or out of it. And down here in the left-hand corner, you see the term digital natives, which um, is opposed to digital immigrants, which might be many of us on the call here, um, those of us that went through school without technology technology in our hands are now the instructors and teachers uh, working with students that have only known that way of seeing. So um, how do we meet them where they are? How do we make that a smooth transition for them um, is uh, one of the questions we ask. And looking at outdoor inquiry as a way to um, look at appropriate use of technology is what we specialize in. Um, just like uh, Brandon, we focus in a place-based context for uh, looking at watershed issues. And um, the topics at Upham Woods and in other places that we teach include 
um, in, are comprised of riparian zone uh, investigations, um, characterizations of microclimates, uh, investigating um, aquatic invertebrates, and um, other uh, observations of local watersheds. The um, uh, technology itself is something that we hope uh, amplifies uh, interest and uh, enhances communication about those important spaces. Um, the uh, point here from Zimmerman is about the artifacts that technology allows us to take. And that could be quantitative uh, in terms of the data itself, numeric, and qualitative in terms of um, the content of photos, content of, of uh, media or videos that um, students take to tell the story of the science they're engaging with. Um, uh, one, one way to frame that is looking at how technology helps us see. And GIS is a really well-known way that that happens um, for layering different uh, data sets to reveal relationships. Um, we see um, the use of peripherals and handheld tools as a way to extend what we can see. And if you um, follow along on this uh, graphic here, you see that there is uh, a set of things what we can see in this white box in the middle. And beyond that box, uh, we, we accept um, in modern society that there are things that are bigger, like uh, in the solar system, and things that are smaller at the atomic level that we can't see but we know exist. Uh, we also know things are beyond our field of vision, um, whether they be x-rays or infrared light. And technology helps us explore those areas. And those areas actually are really important to understanding the environment around us. Um, so we use a program called the DOTS uh, kit, Digital Observation Technology Skills Kits. And these kits um, put those tools in students' hands to deepen their investigations of the forests and watersheds and ecosystems around them. Here you see some of the tools in that kit. And we check these out um, to groups all over the state and um, actually uh, out of state as well. Uh, we lead trainings and do workshops, and it's built upon the scientific method, which this is one version of. And we, when we work with students, we walk through each of these different steps as um, part of uh, the process of developing uh, deep inquiry about our rivers, lakes, and forests that um, become our classrooms. Uh, we focus um, their data collection on two parts of this Venn diagram. One, why do we tell stories? And we ask them, and they answer uh, invariably to educate, to entertain, share ideas, and remember. And then what does it take to tell a scientific study based upon what we just introduced with the scientific method? Um, they, they generally come up with these answers, too. So the piece in the middle is what we want to uh, mediate uh, with our technology, and that is um, using data and observations to, to tell a story scientifically. Um, and encouraging the scientific thinking about the world around us. Um, the design considerations that we employ um, are intended to minimize the troubleshooting threshold in the field and maximize that valuable time outside the classroom or outside of the formal lear learning environment. And that includes some of these considerations here, memory and power, portability, offline capabilities, and uh, digital artifact keeping. Uh, Kits themselves um, are set up so that each tool has a role, and each role has um, an identity and a job to do. And these are some of those um, different roles that, that students use uh, as a team when they divide up um, the kit into these different parts. So the navigator, um, as you might imagine, directs uh, progress throughout the day, while a microbiologist, for example, would study the smaller details of the world around us. Um, here's some. Uh, images from students in the field here uh, using our wireless microscope, um, using a hand lens, and some of the images that result from that. Um, we also use game cameras to capture that invisible world that's there when we're not around. And these are all, um, and here's some raccoons in the river, uh, these are all ways to invite students to wonder a little bit more about what's going on outside. And here's an example of that. And I, I, I love this slide. This, this uh, student left us a, a selfie on our game camera, and I, I often rem have to remember, you know, this is who we're trying to reach, and, um, and they're really comfortable. Students are really comfortable with technology outdoors, and, and we can meet them where they are. Um, our thermal imager can take um, uh, take an average, you know, take an outdoor setting and reveal things that would would otherwise be unobserved by students, as you can see in these examples. 
and uh, our microbiologist role employs the microscope uh, to to take a look at and capture as a team uh, different elements of what we're we're looking at during the day. Um, here's an example of some of the artifacts that that, that tool captures. And in the long run, uh, without going into each tool, uh, this um, allows each of the tools to, to match into, you know, a conversation or um, mentorship about careers or hobbies or skills that might be in different jobs uh, where these tools are found. And I've, I've seen every one of these tools used in a different vocation um, uh, over the course of the last few years, whether it be from research or um, different field applications. Some cases, uh, case studies of this um, include EarPod, engaging at-risk populations outdoors digitally. And we used um, a little bit of grant funding to, to reach a group of students. And they did analog and digital observations outside. And we collected some information about that project. And here's some of their artifacts from what they drew. And, um, and they also captured artifacts from these technology pieces. Um, sharing both of these, um, I think, was a really interesting piece, and uh, we we were trying to answer the question of whether or not technology enhances or distracts from the outdoor world. And um, our results really quickly here, you can see on the far right-hand column, p-values less than 0.001 are significant. And so we found significant interest um, for the technology adaptations of the lesson, that students were interested in using it outside. They were interested in different natural elements of the ecosystem outside because they had some technology in their hands, um, which I think are some of the larger takeaways from this. Uh, we had another case study uh, spinning out of that that uh, worked with a, a dual language immersion school in Milwaukee. And um, this group used a longitudinal uh, ap approach to the tools and um, um, produce similar products over the course of a semester rather than just an uh, episodic uh, use of other facility. Uh, and lastly, Digging Deeper with Data is our um, uh, semester-long program where students um, are working to tell the story of a whole month, and they use these digital tools to um, explore that world around them and uh, share it with uh, people around uh, their classroom. So our impacts have been uh, wide within the state and um, also can be found uh, right here on this website, http uh, fyiux.edu slash environmental education. You can download our case studies, our tools. We have a YouTube channel, and um, there's a, a lot of different um, lessons up there, too. So feel free to uh, give me an email or, or um, fill out one of our question sheets on here if you're looking for a specific uh, adaptation. Um, references for the record uh, you can find here if you're looking for more information on your own development of a project or want to collaborate. And um, there's my email address. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Rebecca. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you, Justin, so much. And I just um, popped that URL into the chat box there for folks so you can have electronic access to that uh, if you want to go check out more about uh, Justin's work and the work at Upham Woods. Now, uh, for our third and final speaker, and I should say, just remind people uh, to uh, submit any questions that you have for our speakers in the chat box there, and we'll be uh, taking those. And um, since we don't have, we've got about uh, 17 people here, so there's not a, a too many people, um, so we'll be able to just go through those uh, one after the other. So please go ahead and submit them your questions there in the chat box. And uh, on to Kelly Feehan, uh, who is a Nebraska uh, Extension Educator uh, and has been doing environmental and horticulture work also for 34 years. So um, she's going to provide us with a great perspective and some other uh, example youth programming that she's working on now. So thanks, Kelly, for joining us. And go right ahead. Thank you, Rebecca, and hello, everyone. And thanks for this opportunity to, um, to share with you um, about some teaching resources uh, called Stormwater Sluice and Running Rain, as you can see there, that we have developed here in Nebraska uh, to help educate our youth about stormwater runoff issues and then about emerging green infrastructure solutions. And these are used, these, these are actually for about fourth through eighth grade. I know that's a broad range, but it's not a specific curriculum. There are teaching resources 
So a variety of people can use them in a variety of ways. We use them at water festivals. We use them, uh, teachers use them in the classroom. Um, we've used them with our Sunday, UNL Sunday with the scientists. Uh, 4-H uh, uses them as well. So they're, they're resources uh, that can be taken and incorporated into current programming. So I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share about them. And I, will, I won't read these overall goals. Um, you can read them. But while I am reading, uh, talking, well, you are reading them, I will mention that once we develop these resources, we have piloted them um, with school teachers across Nebraska, as well as our 4-H youth development uh, staff have piloted them. And last year, we also received a grant from the Nebraska Academy of Science Teachers, and that allowed us to get 117 kits. We refer, we refer to them as a kit if we put them all together. And we were able to get 117 kits in schools um, across Nebraska. And are hoping to build on those now. So who developed? We always have to talk about that. We had a UNL Extension Stormwater Work Group that organized in about 2006. And our purpose was to help our smaller MS4 communities or Phase 2 communities who have to do education and outreach related to the Clean Water Act. And then in about 2009, uh, we did uh, obtain a, a USDA NIFA water quality grant. And along with a variety of other things that we did, we developed these resources with those, that funding. So here's, here are the resources. Uh, the one thing is a comic style booklet. And in this booklet, uh, you can follow Stormwater Sleuth is our raven. And Running Rain is our water drop. And you can follow them on their adventure of discovery um, about watersheds, stormwater runoff, green infrastructure. And I'll talk a little bit more about our characters in the next slide. Uh, but they basically, the booklet includes an inquiry-based activity, uh, a maze, crossword puzzles, just ongoing activities that the students can do. And again, at age 8 to 12, the characters make it look like it's more for you know a younger age group. But the information in there, um, most of the teachers have told us is excellent for like fourth through fifth grade, as well as third grade. Um, and you can, there is a free, you can obtain this for free. You have a free download. Um, the website is there, water.unl.edu backslash or forward slash stormwater. And you can also purchase them at Marketplace. And if you purchase them, you get the glossy cover. And, but they're fine to download as well. So our characters, we created these as mascots for the youth education. And we purposely created a Stormwater Sleuth. And she is a raven. And we wanted a bird who could teach from an overhead watershed perspective. So you know what? The big picture, uh, the big watershed perspective, what's happening upstream, downstream, or just within a watershed. And then, of course, I, I know a lot of educational resources have a water drop, but we felt we needed running rain. And he teaches with his experiences as part of stormwater runoff. So in as they go on their adventure through the education booklet, uh, we see stormwater Sleuth is talking about what he's seeing happening, and Runny Rain is actually experiencing it, and we're watching him experience it. The front cover is colored, the rest of it, to, to save cost, is black and white. Uh, but we have our, our illustrator was excellent. You can see a happy rainwater sleuth who's going where he needs to go, and in many of the pages, you can see a kind of an unhappy running rain um, who's not going where he, he's going where he doesn't want to go. So here's, excuse the quality of this picture. I just took it with my iPad, but it gives you at least one page that gives you a sense. And I'll give you just a half a second or a half a minute to maybe read through that uh, so you have a sense of how it works in the page. Almost every page has four different uh, you know, paint, paint panels. Okay, I'm going to moving on. So that's the booklet. Uh, probably what we're most uh, we're proud of all of it, but this is getting um, a lot of a lot of people are interested in the card game. Um, we've had water festivals in Nebraska purchase enough to give to every teacher, for example, that's attending. Um, we at Iowa, Iowa has purchased a number of these to use in their educational programming. But it's it's basically a deck of cards. 
Uh, there's 120 cards. Uh, every card has a different picture on it, a different definition on it. Uh, 40 of the cards are water threat cards, and those are they're brown colored. And then 80 of them are, are best management practices or green infrastructure of solutions. So basically, if, if you've ever played apples to apples, it's similar to that, um, although it can be used in any way. And, and it's amazing how creative educators become in using these. Uh, but if you use it, one way to use it is to deal the blue cards to participants, to teams, to groups, to individuals. Um, and then you turn over the brown card, which is the threat. And those with the blue cards each have to select, you know, what's a BMP or what's a green infrastructure solution I would have to that threat. And it helps to increase awareness. Um, it provides definitions with a colored picture uh, for better understanding. It can be used as a discussion tool. Um, and it can be used, even though this is youth education, these could easily be used for ages 9 to 99. And they are, because there's a colored picture on every single one, uh, they're a little pricey for a card deck, but inexpensive for an educational tool. And I'll, this, is, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, you can see the water, an example of one of our water threat cards. We have a, a picture and then a, de a, a definition and, and, a, and a vocab word, if you want to call it that. And uh, finally, um, we, there's a series of hands-on activity guides uh, that also are included um, with our kit. And each of them are two to four page guides. And the eight educators in youth and kind of inquiry based investigations um, that will lead to increased awareness, understanding, and additional questions. And these two are for fourth through eighth grade, depending on how the, the teacher, the, the information the teacher shares, how they set it up ahead of time. And you can see the guide titles there. At this time, we have five. We are planning to continue to write additional ones. And I would invite, if there's anybody out there that would like to write one of these or co-write, uh, that's what we're trying to do across the state. Uh, we would be happy to, to visit with you about that, work with you on that. But for example, in the how much water runs out, um, what, what they do, whether it's a 4-H at a 4-H camp or whether it's a classroom, is during a rain, they determine during the rain how many gallons of water would run off of their rooftop. And then the stormwater walk, they have to walk around their property and, and learn and determine where the runoff water goes, what it might take with it uh, when it runs off the school property or the campsite property. So that's just some examples of how the use resources are utilized. And I guess I'm keeping it short and sweet, but we, we are obviously for some of our water festivals, our Sunday with the Scientists, our School of Natural Resources puts on a nature palooza. So we've developed some other fun resources that we can use, stormwater sleuth, and, and then our picture cutout board with running rain. So that's those, a quick overview of these teaching resources um, that we'd be happy to, uh, uh, to share more with you. Again, the, the hands-on activity sheets at this time are not available for free download, but we are looking into getting those posted on our water.unl page so that we can do that. Um, I'd be happy to email them to anybody uh, that might be interested in receiving those. But thank you. Great, and thank I'll you. And the lovely, uh, lovely picture of you there <laughs> as running rain. Uh, okay, so it's time for uh, questions for for all of our presenters. So um, if you're you're thinking about one, please put it in the chat box. And we have one uh, from our colleagues in Illinois. Uh, for all the presenters, what type of evaluation tools are included with your programs? And maybe we just go in order. Um, uh, Brandon, if you can start. Um, yeah, so we um, partnering with our our Great Lakes. Can you can you hear me? Okay, yeah, good. Um, partnering with our Great Lakes uh, Fishery Trust um, uh, colleagues, we have developed a pretty extensive. Uh, set of evaluation tools, a lot of uh, quantitative pre-post assessment, a lot of uh, qualitative um, uh, tools that we use as, as classroom assessments, uh, things like um, asking students to write a letter to next year's class about why, uh, what, about the project they're doing and, and who they're working with and why it's important to the community and to the, to the environment. Um, 
uh, things like um, I, I used to think, but now I know and how I learned it. So a lot of qualitative kinds of uh, tools that we use, and then and then um, a lot of a lot of observation. Um, so it, co collectively, we try to triangulate a lot of uh, data inputs to uh, share. Uh, it's oftentimes in a case study format, share um, not just the academic successes or the youth leadership, the youth development successes, but also talk about the community development goals. What's the value to the community, or what's the value to the community uh, conservation plan for that watershed or that that issue or project? So um, I think we're pretty diverse in the set of tools that we try to, to implement, but we definitely value evaluation as a part of our program. Okay, great. Thanks, Brandon. Justin? Hi, this is Justin Huffam. Um, for our evaluation, we do we have a 12-question uh, uh, battery about technology um, implementation with some um, an emphasis on environmental sciences, and that's um, drawn. We draw uh, questions from the common measures for that, and um, we also have um, a technology comfort survey, which is a um, combination of uh, things that you saw on the slide earlier, uh, the data set that I showed um, was, uh, you can see the exact questions in that if you go back and watch the video. So um, those are the two we, we really stand by. Um, be, uh, we, we, do create, we do have larger data sets with um, qualitative uh, material and some of the um, artifact-based assessments that we can, we can run with um, the things that are captured digitally. But um, uh, to keep uh, apples to apples across all our programs, we, we have a, a little under 30 questions we, we generally use, which, which are, as I mentioned, uh, a mixture of common measurements and then technology comfort. Thanks, Justin. And what are uh, maybe some folks on the uh, some of the participants aren't youth educators? Maybe what are the common measures? I mean, not what you know, not listing them, but what what is that? <laughs> I've prepared some remarks. I'll read them to you. <laughs> um, no, uh, the common measures are uh, coming from a national level uh, for uh, for each youth development um, at the national council. So we wanted to draw from the um, Science, technology, engineering, and math um, elements of that, because it helps our our uh, youth development educators um, communicate their impact. Perfect. Thanks. And Kelly, we have mainly used pre and post tasks with the resources we provide them uh, for the kits that went out to those 117 schools. For example, we provided pre and post test questions. And then we used a Qualtrics survey to obtain, gather that information back. Um, another creative thing that we have done is with one, if you know, one of our hands-on activity guides is public service announcements. So we were teaching students how to do PSAs effectively. Uh, so one, th one thing we did um, after one of our workshops is, or during the workshop, we, it was older teens, we had them videotaping. Um, you know, we visited gray infrastructure as well as green infrastructure. And if you don't know what that means, most people do, you can ask me. But And we had them videotape. And then they went home and they prepared a, a, a PSA, a video PSA, for example, and then just and sent it back to us. And we kind of used that kind of more for observation, evaluation. Why did they really understand this? Um, what did they learn? So that was kind of a creative and different way that we did some evaluation and increased learning. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, other questions from participants? Cost and uh, source of a DOTS kit, Justin. Yeah. Um, well, uh, good question. Uh, the I make all the dots kits. Um, I I um, uh, so that's if you want them, I want one built. I've I've done that for groups, and um, I do that on two levels. One is a kind of a, a low res low resolution data collection, and that's that runs close to two thousand um, dollars. 
and then a high res high resolution um, set of instruments which runs around 3200 bucks and um, the difference between those is basically the um, the higher quality equipment is in the second kit that captures um, um, you know deeper imagery or more precise information now the trade-off is if you get uh, you can introduce the basic concepts of all these things with the lower res kit and um, um, that's what I personally use when I teach um, more often than not because I can get more of them out in the hands of, of youth but um, for some of the longitudinal projects um, that are directly tied to some citizen science then um, people do elect for the the um, higher res one so um, if you want give me a ring um, 608-224-9965 or you can send you know get me at my email address there and I could I could uh, talk to you more about the details of the dots kits but um, I've um, it's, it's kind of our um, our project and um, I don't I don't know you know I think uh, LabQuest makes some um, some kits um, through, uh, and I think you can get some FOSS kits uh, that do similar stuff. But um, as far as the DOTS kits, it's it's unique to our development cycle, and um, we have a lot of support for it. So that's why I'm a fan of it as well. That we've got lessons and YouTube tutorials on each of the tools. So when our volunteers get them, they can go to the web and get those answers and um, be self-supporting. So. Thanks for the questions. Or I'm not sure if that's all of the question, but um, that's what I got. Yes, no, it looks like it. Um, and folks can keep posting other questions. Um, I had one for Brandon, and I just want to thank all three of you for reminding us how inspiring the places that we work um, and live and play are. There's some beautiful photos there. And Brandon, I was interested if you, um, in how you pick priority issues and programming strategies in the different places that you work. So you talked about the, you know, listening and learning that these heritage archaeological sites might have some interesting programming opportunities. But how do you, how do you make those decisions? Um, you, you know, Rebecca, that's a, a great question, and I think, um, you know, you two are triangulate. We are really trying to always think of. Uh, the three audiences, right? So there's the, the community audience that might be the resource conservation agency or the uh, community development um, committee or plan. There's the uh, the school goals in terms of uh, teacher learning plans or school improvement goals or you know our, our next generation science standards, Michigan science standards. And then the third, and I, I really believe this is maybe the most important, is student voice. Uh, so we're always trying to balance those three uh, voices in that conversation of well, uh, what what should our project be? So uh, in some cases, um, I'll use an example of we have uh, three really amazing uh, coastal state parks with uh, between the three parks close to 22 miles of wide open lake here on shoreline that's uh, that are well documented for their biodiversity, rare, threatened, and endangered species and. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, managing those habitats, protecting those species, promoting ecotourism. So there, are, there are a lot of projects that are just teed up for uh, youth, uh, citizen science kind of engagement. And so it's really easy to at, approach those park managers and say, hey, you know, there's a lot of youth that want to use this as a, as a field study site. What are some projects that we could engage them in that are going to help you um, advance the bar, move the bar on your management plan? Uh, sometimes the teachers are inspired by a project. We have, uh, this isn't a water project, but a monarch watch project uh, with the I think it's the University of Kansas. But just you know, tag, it's another citizen science project, just tagging monarch butterflies. A lot of uh, early elementary teachers were very excited about monarchs. They are great for teaching life cycles, and they're awesome. Uh, you know, with little kids, you know, stickers and butterflies. You can't go wrong uh, when you're working with really young young kids. And in that case, it was a, a project that was inspired by the teachers, but we really connected it with a citizen science opportunity that we uh, knew of that where the students could add value. And then thirdly, uh, sometimes uh, it's just starting with student exploration, letting them out into their community, letting them talk with community partners, letting them ask questions. Uh, some of these science questions can be just using an inquiry process, letting students ask questions that they can then use science, science to answer. But always challenging them to say, how is this going to 
how is this going to benefit your community? Thanks, Brandon. And it sounds like it's a, it's a formative process that you go, go through, that you have these ongoing relationships, and that's how you you get these questions answered. It doesn't sound like, you know, you had a grant pro, pro, grant proposal that wasn't, um, you know, where, where you decided what the program was. It sounds like there is that really pre-programming collaboration. Is that right? Absolutely, and I, I think um, I, I think that's ex exactly right. So we're, our, when we talk with teachers about getting in, engaged in place-based education and water stewardship, we're really talking about um, the process and the relationships, how we're going to do, do that, more so than um, we want you to adopt this curriculum or this lesson plan or buy into this project. And then we try to backfeed if, there, if there's grants grant opportunities that pop up or if there's curriculum that are uh, a great fit for that particular uh, teacher, school, and community, then we want to in inject or insert them strategically when they make sense along that, that timeline. But I think what you said is important is that long-term relationship with the teachers and the schools and helping them to think um, uh, think about this isn't just a, this isn't a project, it's a long-term uh, process and program uh, is, is, is where we get to uh, some of these really awesome opportunities over time. And they don't often look. Um, I shared the example of the kids building robots and studying zebra mussels. Their project did not start out that complex. They started out very simply just going to the river and testing for water quality and collecting aquatic insects. They evolved into that, that complexity by asking questions about their watershed. Mm -hmm. And you're getting into this question by that Jesse has. Uh, if any of our presenters can share examples of projects that are identified and led by students, uh, I mean, I, I I know I don't want to. I mean, well, I'll just weigh in and I'll, I'll be quiet. But I think um, the, the the one best example I have is the Thunder Bay Watershed Project uh, in one particular elementary class where their whole class is framed on, on the watershed and what they do um, early on is, is they do some some uh, longitudinal, uh, we do this every year, water testing and so they've got some data that they collect and use those data to um, compare last year to this year, and et cetera. But during the course of the year, they're inviting resource agencies and research scientists into the classroom and asking questions about the watershed, trying to gain knowledge and then really they, so they'll invite Michigan Sea Grant in and they'll, they'll ask us straight up at the end of that conversation, what can we do? What questions could we ask or investigate that would be helpful? And so we weigh in, they make the decision and each year um, their projects may change. So they've studied fever mussels, they've monitored invasive rusty crayfish. Right now their focus this year was biodiversity conservation and lake trout restoration. So the projects change, but their process of how they engage scientists and ask what kinds of questions can we explore while we're in school. Um, that is pretty consistent year to year. Okay, thank you. And uh, Justin or Kelly, do you have anything to add there? Yeah, this is Justin. Uh, in the case studies I mentioned at the tail end of my presentation, um, those, uh, those longitudinal uh, examples of implementation for the DOTS kits were um, set up so that students could identify and lead their inquiry. Um, we would set them in motion with um, a little bit of an orientation and training on it. And um, in the end, um, they pursued the questions that they were interested in once they learned the capabilities of the instruments themselves. Um, so the group uh, from La, La Escuela Verde, um, you know, they, they had six teams within their their class unit and they each looked at different questions they had about the outdoor world around them. Um, the Digging Deeper with Data group um, took a look at um, some of the more specific climate things that interested, interested them. And um, this next year we'll have um, a project with um, uh, Escuela Verde uh, for a translation um, of their of that m method and uh, the products being in Spanish as a product at the other end. So um, that was a, something they identified as a as a need in, in their lead. And so it's kind of a couple different examples of that. Thanks. 
Kelly? Uh, no, I guess I don't really have anything to share on that. You know, I guess pertaining though to that last question, um, which is part of this, those hands-on activity guides could easily, those are activities and educational things that could easily be led um, by a student, uh, an older student with younger students, um, Jeffy, and and could build on them, uh, build on them quite a bit. Great, thank you. And Justin, I have a couple uh, questions for you, um, and you may have said this, but what, what age groups do you use the DOTS kits with? And then um, my second question is, I just briefly caught a glimpse of the, the I care about nature um, question in those, in the EarPod um, survey, I think that's, and I was just, it looked like uh, there was not a significant result with the, you know, I care about nature. I was, I was curious if um, you could say more about what that means or what you noticed uh, about that result. Yeah, you bet. Um, the first question, um, we generally work with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders um, or with uh, units of instructors like uh, teacher professional development or instructor trainings. Um, but we have worked with groups as young as second grade and, um, and as old as college students and everything in between. Um, with respect to the second question you had, Rebecca, um, the um, care about nature piece um, was not significantly uh, different in pre and post. And um, I, I don't have that slide up or control that slide right now. Um, to quote that number, maybe I can find my copy of it real quick. But um, the um, uh, you'll notice that that's the only one that didn't have a positive correlation. And it had, a, a, more importantly, I would encourage you to look at the fact that the pretest score for I Care About Nature was a 4.57 out of 5. And um, the post uh, answer was 4.52. So you're talking about five hundredths of a point lower, um, which is not a significant uh, difference or p-value uh, to make conclusions from. But probably more importantly to note is that there's a ceiling effect with that question, I think, in that those are the highest two net values of all the questions asked. So if you look all the way through the pre-test answers, um, 4.57 is the highest um, I care about nature. And in the post, uh, 4.52 is is the second highest um, out of those. So um, I I would be, uh, well, I obviously have an opinion about it, but um, it would be pretty hard to draw a conclusion that, that, that the students have a change in their concern about nature there. And um, in fact, what came in, that I'd say the conclusion I would draw is that they came in um, with a high score about caring about nature and they left with a high score about caring about nature. Right, that's the, the bottom line is kids care about nature. <laughs> and so right, uh, right. it's a great, yeah, great teaching opportunity, right. Great, yeah. hey, hey, thank you. Um, I, I just sort of, and thanks Janice uh, for moving moving those slides and getting that slide in front of us. Um, okay, just a final question, a very quick question before we end. Um, Kelly, can you tell us, I was curious about the Sunday with a scientist program. If you just want to say something briefly about that program. Okay, that's, it's held at uh, the museum on uh, UNL campus, and they just have a variety of Sunday with a scientist, and they bring in professors from the university. They often have students that are helping with that. And it, it's a wide range of topics. And we go in and you're there for a whole Sunday afternoon and just interacting with the youth and doing hands-on um, things with them and teaching them about your particular science. Intriguing title. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Okay. And, if you and thank Google it, if you, I'm sorry. If you would Google Sunday with the scientist, I think you have a better sense. Uh, you, plus you and Al. Um, there'll be some more information for you. Perfect. Thank you. And th thank you to all of our, our speakers today, um, Brandon, Justin, and, and Kelly. And again, there's their uh, 
their email addresses for you if you'd like to contact them with, uh, for more information about any of their excellent programs. Um, we just wanted to, again, remind you that this session will be archived uh, so uh, at northcentralwater.org, so please uh, feel free to, to share uh, the link with anyone you think might be interested. We will, um, we have a couple of upcoming sessions, uh, one on July 20th, Green Infrastructure for Water Resource Management, and August 17th, Status of Groundwater Resources in the North Central Region. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us, and uh, look forward to uh, working with you sometime in the future and maybe seeing you on another webinar. Take care, everybody. Thanks.